day, Jonathan's father was King Saul. He was the golden boy, wasn't he? First Samuel 20. <laughs> he was an accomplished warrior, a respectful leader, and heir to the throne, wasn't he? See, David was the youngest son of Jesse, who was a shepherd. And Jonathan and him probably became friends when David was sent to, the, up to Saul to play the harp because he had an evil spirit. And the only thing that would soothe that evil spirit to start out with was David playing the harp. But it didn't prolong it, did it? Yeah, it changed, didn't it? See, their friendship, and that's why this lesson is, is going to be about friendship. Friendship is the kind of friendship every one of us wants, isn't it? Male or female. Really longs for our heart of hearts. They were close friends, Jonathan and David. Each one devoted to the other. It was probably one of those friendships where they were just as comfortable sitting in silence as they were talking and laughing with one another. That's the kind of friendship we all want, isn't it? Especially when we become a Christian. We want friends who will laugh with us, cry with us. We want friends who know our faults and love us anyway, don't we? We want friends who accept us and understand us, challenge us and stick by us. We want friends like Jonathan. See, it, when you have a friend like Jonathan, it involves in developing and deepening our relationship. A relationship is that will assume ever increasing importance as we move out of our lives and serve Christ. I mean, when you go out of here, you don't want to be have friends that are not Christians. Because what's going to happen? You backslide. You're going to go be right back where you were before you started, aren't you? Oh, off to the races, yeah. <laughs> As a key relationship during the coming years of your life, it is going to be your friendships, particularly your closest friendships, and it's so important for your continued growth in Christ, isn't it? And fulfillment is a friend like Jonathan. That kind of friendship is flawless diamond or a string of perfect pearls. It's rare and priceless. Because you know, not a lot of people are friends like, that, like Jonathan was to David, were they? But how can you find a friend like Jonathan? I mean, after all, there aren't many real princes left, are they? Let me begin to answer that question by asking you to turn to 1 Samuel 20. Because I'm fully convinced that if you truly want to develop a friendship like the one David and Jonathan have, if you truly want to find a friend like Jonathan, then you need more than anything else to cultivate a heart like Jonathan's. And like David's. What kind of heart did David have? One after God, didn't it? You need more than anything else. You also probably heard that old saying that if you want a friend, you got to be a friend, don't you? If you want to find a friend like Jonathan, 
You got to cultivate a heart like Jonathan. Now, David now fled from Nanner to Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done? He exclaimed. What is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That's not true, Jonathan protested. You're not going to die. He always tells me everything he's going to do, even the little things. I know my father wouldn't hide something like that from me. It just isn't so. Then David took an oath before Jonathan and said, Your father knows perfectly well about our friendship. So he has said to himself, I won't tell Jonathan. Why should I hurt him? But I swear to you that I am only a step away from death. I swear it by the Lord and by your own soul. Tell me what I can do to help you, Jonathan exclaimed. And you, okay, I want to go back like last week. What happened to David? Yes, he was, he, Saul was trying to pin him to the wall, wouldn't he? He's trying to kill him. And he, it even so bad that he used his own daughter, didn't he? He was laying in the bed. She put the idol in the bed, covered it up, act like it was David in there. Or what did Saul do? He sent his men to kill David, didn't he? To drag him out of his own bed. Because he said, she told, McCall told her daddy that he was sick. He didn't care. Yes. He didn't care if he's sick or whatever. He sent his men to go get him, to bring his whole bed and everything to him. So we're going to do four characteristics of his heart. Loyalty. Jonathan was the prince he was next in line to the throne of Israel. When David came to him with the news that Jonathan's dead was out to get David, Jonathan first responded with, no way. He could not believe that his dad was going to do that to him, could he? But when David took an oath and used a very serious vow, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, Jonathan understood that David was not messing with his head, didn't he? As you see how Jonathan responded once he realized David was absolutely serious. Look at verse 4 again. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. That is a voice of loyalty, isn't it? See, here Jonathan was a prince. He knew that protecting David would mean that he would lose his kingdom, didn't it? It also meant that he could even lose his life, that his daddy could have him killed. Because how many times now has his daddy's already tried to kill him one time, hadn't he? And we'll see later on, he tries to kill him again. So his daddy has no loyalty toward his own kids. So he surely would not have any loyalty toward David, would he? See, he had, what are you willing to risk for your friends? If your loyalty could be measured on a thermometer, would it be closer to freezing or boiling? <laughs> huh? Lukewarm? <laughs> Would you lay down your life for your friend? Would you give up your reputation? Comfort? Popularity? Yeah. It is nothing, isn't it? 
In kingdom of God, we're all equal, aren't we? See, Jonathan understood, or David understood Jonathan risked everything to accomplish his goal, didn't he? He was willing to risk his throne, his kingdom, to protect his friend, wouldn't he? Even his life. He would have given up his life probably for his friend if he had to. Because he knew his daddy was not in his right mind and that he could just snap any time, didn't he? I don't think Jonathan would have helped David hide a drug habit or keep suicidal thoughts a secret. Do you? No. Or anything like that. Because to do such things for a friend would be disloyal, wouldn't it? Because those things would endanger that friend, wouldn't they? Not protect him. So if you want to cultivate a heart like Jonathan's heart, you must develop a heart of loyalty. That might mean listening to your friend instead of watching TV or listening to your favorite radio station or whatever you read in your favorite book. It might mean confronting your friend about a bad habit. When you even have trouble telling them if they got food in their teeth. So. <laughs> that might mean canceling a trip on vacation to go to your best friend's fun grandmother's funeral. It also might mean sometimes saying to your friend, as Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. So the first characteristic of Jonathan's heart was loyalty. The second we'll find in 5 through 17. David replied, tomorrow we celebrate the new moon festival. I always eat with the king on this occasion, but tomorrow I hide in the field and stay there until evening of the third day. If your father asks where I am, tell him I ask permission to go home to Bethlehem for an annual family sacrifice. If he says, fine, you will know all is well. But if he is angry and loses his temper, you will know he is determined to kill me. Show me this loyalty as a sworn friend, for we have made a solemn pact before the Lord. Or kill me yourself if I have sinned against your father. But please don't betray him to me. Never, Jonathan exclaimed. You know that I, if I had the slightest notion my father was planning to kill you, I would tell you at once. Then David asked, how will I know whether or not your father is angry? Come out to the field with me, Jonathan replied. And they went out there together. Then Jonathan told David, I promise by the Lord, the God of Israel, that by this time tomorrow, the next day or the latest, I will talk to my father and let you know at once how he feels about you. If he speaks favorably about you, I will let you know. But if he is angry and wants you to be killed, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. And may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David, saying, May the Lord destroy all your enemies. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow a friendship again, for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. Love. The second characteristic of Jonathan's heart was love, wouldn't it? The Bible says he loved David as he loved himself. 
Now that's significant. Notice I did not say that he loved David more than himself. He loved him as himself, didn't he? That is a picture of God, isn't it? Biblical friendship. Now you find that kind of love for a friend doesn't come along every day, does it? You may have many friends and you will acquire many more over the next few years, especially if you're in this program here. But very few friends, perhaps none, well, only one will love you as they love their self. Now, Jonathan's heart is because it's a heart that loves a friend as much as oneself. So a heart like Jonathan will be a heart of loyalty and a heart of love. The third characteristic is shown in the next part of 1 Samuel 20. Then Jonathan said, tomorrow we celebrate the new moon festival. You will be missed when your place is at the table is empty. The next day after tomorrow toward evening, go to the place where you hid before and wait there by the stone pile. I will come out and shoot three arrows to the side of the stone pile as though I were shooting at a target. Then I will send a boy to bring the arrow back. If you tell, hear me tell him... They're on this side, then you will know, as surely as the Lord lives, that all is well and there is no trouble. But if I tell him, go further, the arrows are still ahead of you, then it will mean that you must leave immediately, for the Lord is sending you away. And may the Lord make us keep our promises to each other, for he is witnessing them." So David himself hid himself in the field. And when the new moon festival began, the king sat down to eat. He sat in his usual place against the wall where Jonathan sitting opposite of him and Abner beside him. But David's place was empty. Saul didn't say anything about it that day. For he said to himself, something must have made David unclean. But when David's place was empty again the next day, Saul said to Jonathan, Why hasn't the son of Jesse been here for the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan replied, David earnestly asked me if he could go to Bethlehem. He said, Please let me go, for we are having a family sacrifice. My brother demanded that I be there, so please let me get away to see my brother's. That's why he isn't here at the king's table. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. I don't think I want to say that. <laughs> I think I'm going to read this version. <laughs> Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send and bring him to me, for he must die. Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Jonathan got up from the table in fierce anger. On that second day of the month, he did not eat because he was grieved at his father's shameful treatment of David. In the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for the meeting with David. He had a small boy with him. And he said for, to the boy, run and find the arrows I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out after him, isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, hurry, go quickly, don't stop. 
The boy picked up the arrow and returned to his master. The boy knew nothing of all of this. Only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said, Go carry them back to town. After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan and wept three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. See, that passage right there reveals another key characteristic Again, about Jonathan's heart, don't it? And that was accountability. If you add this component to your deepest friendships, it will change your life, won't it? Notice that Jonathan made himself accountable to David. Now, he could have done anything he wanted, couldn't he? Jonathan could have. He was the king's son. He was heir to the throne. He had servants. He had wealth. He had bound himself to David in friendship, hadn't he? In a way, that made him accountable to David, didn't it? Accountability means voluntary giving another person authority to question you or correct you and to hold you responsible, you responsible for your conduct. Jonathan became accountable to David by making a vow that he would report his father's intentions to David. He promised to do some, do help for David, didn't he? And signal him as to whether he was safe to return to the palace. What will accountability mean in your relationships? Will you be held accountable to somebody? See, that depends on what your greatest fears and struggles are. It means meeting with a close Christian friend of the same sex, not someone, a woman, another woman, or another man, to confess your struggles, your sins, and allowing a friend to hold you accountable for what you do and don't do. See, that's the kind of relationship we have to have with a friend, isn't it? We have to hold each other accountable, don't we? Like, okay, here's a, have you spent at least a half hour each day in prayer or Bible reading each week? Or what sins have you committed since we last met? See, that's where you have to hold. And it has to be a good friend. I mean, you just don't go up to somebody that you don't feel like is a friend to you and just tell them all your secrets to you. Because a lot of people, they can turn them around on you, can't they? Mm. And if you don't feel like you have anybody that you can trust... We have one we can trust, don't we? Amen. Jesus. We can get alone. In it. That's what our prayer is about, isn't it? It's all what our prayer life is. We have to be accountable to the Lord, don't we? Why do we have to be accountable to the Lord? Right, we don't go back, do we? Right, you don't want to go back, do you? After you go through here once, it should be your last time, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> As what Mike says, we don't want the boomerangs, right? Several, <laughs> several, 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 several different programs. Several, that's another. It's understood I've been through more than one. And 
I always thought that I figured that, you know, like, oh, hey, I'm in rehab. whoop de doo Basil, what does it all mean? Like, I figured I was, go okay, I'm clean. I, 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 I'm good now. But I got out. I've never actually graduated and completed a rehab. I've been kicked out of every one. <laughs> what does that mean? I, I <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I never, uh, I never truly put my faith and my trust and relied on Jesus to help me. But this time, I've done a lot better than I have in any of them. But have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? So that's the difference. I mean, you can. I know of people that do that that have put their faith and trust in Jesus or they profess that they have, but then they get out in the world and it just slaps them like a wet sock. Don't it. I'm looking at someone. <laughs> Don't it. It does, don't it? It's hard, isn't it? The world is so hard on us. And not necessarily your friends. It can be your own family members. They're usually the worst ones on us. They're just sitting there waiting on us to mess up, aren't they? Yes. So they can say, well, I told you so. <laughs> I hear it, I've heard it all my life. Right. Instead of the future, right. They want to look at what you've done instead of what you can be. And so, but see, we have to get it in our heart that we can do better, that we do trust the Lord. And no matter what anybody tells us, our family, our friends, we're going to look forward to the future. We are not going to pick this up and put it back in our pocket and go backwards, are we? Yes, you know where you came from. Right. <laughs> so you can see the Ford, right? <laughs> see, faith. That's another thing. In the la and so Jonathan's heart was characterized by love, loyalty, accountability. But one final aspect of his heart which is mentioned all through 1 Samuel 20, is the last verse, verse 42. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn a friendship to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to town. See, one reason David found such a soulmate in Jonathan is because they shared a common faith, didn't they? One reason David found such a soul, soulmate, listen to that again, I'm going to repeat it, is because they shared a common faith. Because something, sometimes a lot of people have difficult to hear, isn't it? You have to share a common faith with someone, don't you? But it's going to be crucial if you want to develop friendships like the one between Jonathan and David. 
2 Corinthians 6, 14 is a verse that's usually applied to marriage or dating. But the real application is much broader. That verse says, Do not be yoked together. One version says, Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with the darkness? Now I'm not going to tell you that that verse means you cannot have non-believers as friends. But what it does say, however, is that you should not allow yourself to be yoked with an unbeliever. To be bound together with any non-Christian friend. First Corinthians, or yeah, Second Corinthians six fourteen. That means that your most intimate friendships, friendships that bind you together, must possess a common faith. That was true in Jonathan and David's case. And it should be no less and mine are your friendship. I know. You got to pray for them. If you're married, already married to them. Well, that's... I'll give you my testimony sometime. That's... It's, it, nine times out of ten, it does not work. Mm-hmm. She can't make him drink. See, what it means is a Christian, if your closest friend is an unbeliever, then you are on dangerous ground, aren't you? You see, a yoke is a wooden harness that a farmer would put on the shoulders of two oxen or horses to take their strength and bind it together in one effective two for plowing and clearing land. The problem with wearing a yoke, though, is that both animals must go in the same direction. So when you're yoked with someone, you're got to be going in that same direction with each other. But if you're unyoked, one of, they can go their way and you can go your way. Right. I mean, you're going to constantly be fighting because we had, we had horses, and if they didn't like the other one, they was constantly biting them and trying to kick them and everything else when they was trying to walk by each other. And that's how it is to be yoked with a non-Christian or someone that does not love the Lord. They're going to be constantly biting at you, and I don't mean biting you, which, I mean, that's possible too. But, <laughs> yeah. And they're going to constantly be throwing you down and putting you down and telling you that, uh, what? Yeah. Yeah. They want to just constantly be goading you, don't they? Yes. See, as Christian men and women, if you're pulling your friend toward God, your friend will be pulling you away. I mean, you can witness to them and tell them how much God loves them and that you love them, but if you don't reach them in the first few times, go away. 
turn the other way, don't you? And for those yet who are not believers, I urge you to realize that if your closest friend is a Christian, you may be doing your friend more harm than good. As much as you may love your friend, you cannot help them grow in faith, can you? If you're not going to believe in God, or you're not going to be a believer in Jesus Christ as our Savior, you're going to pull your friend down, aren't you? See, Jonathan's heart was a heart of loyalty, love, accountability, and faith in God. And if you want friends who accept you and understand you, challenge you, stick by you, and you can accept you, you can do no better than by cultivating a heart like Jonathan and David. And that's quite a task, isn't it? <laughs> It's probably too much for you to do on your own, isn't it? <laughs> That's only because God is willing to help you do it. Get in your word. Ask God what he has for you. And if you do not know him, I urge you to call out to him now. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to touch each one here, dear Lord. And dear Lord, if they do not know you, I just ask you to just come into their heart right now and just touch them, dear Lord. Just touch their heart, dear Lord, and fill their mind, dear Lord, with everything that's good. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs>